So this is a, um, a signaling cascade, a signaling uh, link in which there are a lot of chains. Now this is protein structure network. What's important here, the proteins arranged in a certain way. This corresponds with physical configuration and some kind of a molecule can bind and change this, such as this. Ibogaine protein, small molecule. It has an array of charges that interact with this is charged as well. And there can be molecules that interact with this, with these portions of uh, proteins, of signaling proteins. Uh, and the alteration of shape, uh, the alteration of form, um, also affects the alteration of function. Um, there's a signaling element called adenylate cyclase. Uh, as I referenced before, it's inhibited uh, acutely with the administration of opioids, and it is overactive in withdrawal. Um, in the mid-1990s, uh, somebody ex uh, found out that adenylate cyclase, which is one of the elements here, and again, with, this is, in, this is at more active in withdrawal, less active in the state of o opioid uh, agonist activity. So when it's getting an opioid signal, it shuts down. When it's not getting one, it gets more active. And this is what's mediating withdrawal. And this one is acting here. That's a very exciting possibility, uh, and it's one that we're going to be following. This work was done in the mid-90s. I think it's one of the most important papers. It's ignored. Uh, the authors of this paper, I asked them why they didn't follow up on this exciting result, and they said they thought there was no funding in it at the time. Well, we've got some funding now to, re to uh, replicate this study, uh, and uh, we hope to do that in the next year. The observed attenuation in the withdrawal syndrome of morphine-dependent mice by ibogaine cannot be attributed to ibogaine substituting as an agonist at the opioid receptor. This is not an agonist action. The agonist action would occur up here. This is downstream. So basically, if, you, if morphine binds up here, it's going to shut this down. Morphine's not binding. Uh, ibogaine is not active at this receptor. Uh, ibogaine has no intrinsic activity in terms of activating this receptor. So the, this is not coming from the receptor. This is due to an action on adenylate cyclase itself. So here we're getting beyond the receptor. This is fundamentally new pharmacology. And um, another variant of the opioid agonist theory um, is that noribogaine, which is also a mu agonist, um, is retained in the body indefinitely for long periods of time. Um, uh, this is a so-called pseudo-irreversible agonist. Pseudo-irreversible means um, essentially that it's almost like an irreversible agonist because it stays in the body for so long. This is the presence in the rat of ibogaine and nor ibogaine. A rat is administered ibogaine and levels um, are measured uh, in the rat, uh, in the brain and body, uh, and uh, you have, these are levels at, you've know, got um, females and males that were looking at, at differences in gender, uh, and uh, typically males uh, metabolize faster than females, that happens in the rat. But let's not look at the gender differences. Let's just look at how much is left at one hour, at five hours. The half-life of Ibogaine rat, the time it takes to eliminate half the drug in the rat is one to two hours. So here's Ibogaine, here's nor Ibogaine. There's almost nothing left at 19 hours, yet in self-administration studies you typically get effects on self-administration that last for two or three days. So at least in the animal model, uh, it is unlikely that the persistent metabolite is mediating this effect. What's more likely happening is some kind of a persistent alteration, uh, something like not uh, substituting um, as an agonist at the receptor, and the active agent does not need to persist in the body to cause a long-lasting effect. Um, if ibogaine is not acting as an agonist, we might have the expectation that it is producing some kind of a long-lasting effect that is beyond, dur in, enduring beyond the occupancy of the drug at the receptor. The expression of glial-derived glial neurotropic factor has implications not only for addiction but Parkinson's disease, uh, where G GDNF causes the regeneration, the sustenance of, uh, of uh, dopamine neurons. Um, its expression is increased by ibogaine, uh, which is very significant 
uh, in terms of the restoration of dopamine neurons that are particularly damaged by stimulants. Um, also in Parkinson's disease, there's a primate degeneration of um, neurons. It's difficult to get GDNF into the cerebral spinal uh, fluid. Uh, and GDNF expressed in the brain by ibogaine is, one, is, is a potential strategy for doing that. Um, GDNF has a number of activities expected of an anti-addictive agent. This is something that's produced in the body. Glial-derived neurotropic factor. Glial is a type of neuron derived from glia, neurotrophic, trophic to, to stimulate growth factor. Um, GDNF diminishes self-administration of cocaine and alcohol. Um, it also uh, diminishes and model, this is an animal model of craving that's also diminished. Uh, conversely, con chronic exposure to drugs is a state in which GDNF is reduced. And the infusion of GDNF reverses some of the changes associated with addiction, and it promotes the survival and function of dopamine neurons. GDNF has a uh, positive feedback loop uh, Ibogaine causes the expression of, this is a model by Dort Ron's group uh, out at the University of California. Um, Ibogaine uh, acts in the nucleus to cause the expression of GDNF. Uh, GDNF then binds at the surface to produce more GDNF, a positive feedback loop. Uh, you want positive feedback loops for growth, uh, evolutionarily speaking. Growth has to occur explosively under conditions of uh, plenty and it has to stop. Uh, under conditions where nutrients are limiting. Uh, so basically, you would expect a positive le feedback loop in nature just to take advantage of the, uh, you know, the sufficiency and starvation rhythm of the availability of food in the natural world. Um, so Ibogaine has a number of effects on signaling pathways relevant to addiction. Again, none of this is really important. It's just that so, you know, downstream from the receptor, there are a lot of effects. There's a lot of effects that are associated with receptor binding that do not have to originate with the receptor itself. Uh, ibogaine, another mechanism of action theory, is a group of theories that liken ibogaine to what we already know. Um, you know, the old story about the drunk and the lamppost, uh, the drunk has uh, found, you know, three blocks from a bar looking under the lamppost for his keys, and a policeman walks up to him and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm looking for my keys. Uh, I think I may have left them in the bar. Well, why are you looking under the lamppost? Because this is where the light is. Uh, you know, the point is that basically people are going to look at what they already know. Um, so the analogy with classical hallucinogens uh, is made uh, on the basis of Ibogaine being uh, classified as hallucinogens, even though its effects differ somewhat from classical hallucinogens. Classical hallucinogens include LSD, DMT, psilocybin, mescaline. These are uh, agents that bind at a particular receptor, and that's how they're defined. The harmala alkaloids, which is a, uh, an element in ayahuasca. Um, MDMA uh, is also classified uh, as a psychedelic, at least according to Rick Doblin. You know, that's part of the lexicon. Uh, kappa agonist, this is the Greek letter kappa. Um, that's salvia divinorum, uh, which I guess gets to uh, be in the hallucinogen family. So these are all theories of Ibogaine's mechanism of action that have been suggested at one point or another. There's a whole problem with this whole analogy to psychedelics. There's a terminology issue. Psychedelic does not, does not designate a pharmacological classification. And then entheogen really um, illustrates a context of use or a set of the individual user and does not designate a pharmacological classification. At hallucinogen, many of the salient experiences of Ibogaine are not involve hallucinations. So these terms make it difficult. Classical hallucinogens is a term uh, direct, uh, introduced by David Nichols, uh, who is probably the most prominent uh, living hallucinogen chemist, uh, aside from Sasha Shulgin. There is an analogy between the indoles, Ibogaine, and serotonin. And, you know, th this is one basis for thinking that Ibogaine is like classical hallucinogens. However, classical hallucinogens have one neurotransmitter, serotonin, that binds at one receptor type. And if this is what a classical hallucinogen binds at this type of serotonin receptor. 5-HT is an abbreviation for serotonin. It's the 2A receptor. There's 14 uh, serotonin uh, receptor subtypes. And this is the one at which classical hallucinogens, and there's a lot of good evidence that uh, David Nichols has advanced for the theory that these hallucinogens act at this particular receptor.